Okay, so let's pick up with the golem's eye, um, chapter 36. Just real briefly, in 35, towards the end of it, Kitty gets home after the, I don't know what you'd want to call it, the raid slash failure um, at Westminster Abbey on Gladstone's tomb. She, she goes back to um, the hideout, essentially crashes for a while, and then she goes home. When she goes home, she finds John Mandrake there and has a little interview with him. And he tries to curse her with a Mowler, Mueller, however you pronounce it. And she repels that. Um, she fights him off, essentially. She admits to some extent what she's been doing. But she also, you know, takes, takes the time to point out that a few years previously, three years previously, when she ran into John Mandrake in that, you know, alleyway, um, he said something about being left for dead. And she said, no, if, uh, I can't remember which one, if, if Stanley had had his way, he would have killed you. She said, I, in fact, saved your life, right? I'm trying to remember exactly where that is. Um, Page 423. She says, I deny one thing. You said I left you for dead in that alley. That is itself. Fred. Fred would have cut your throat, but I spared you. Heaven knows why, you miserable little sneak. I should have done the world a favor. Okay. So we pick up with 36. Um, and Nathaniel's thinking about, you know, if he can get the staff of Gladstone, then his status will be elevated. And on 429, you know, he thinks retrieving the staff would have enhanced his status. Second. Uh, would have enhanced his status immeasurably. The prime minister would have lauded him to the skies. Perhaps he would have been promoted, blah, blah, blah. In other words, it's all about pride, right? His, his pride and such. So he runs into make peace or make peace runs into him and make peace talks about the dangers he's in and the danger, he meaning Nathaniel, and the dangers the prime minister is in and how he can't trust, you know, Henry Duvall or Jessica Whitwell or the others. And he kind of tells him, work with me. Okay. And he, he kind of, you know, he lets on that he knows what Nathaniel's been up to. He's been to the public records office, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so he says, he finishes chapter 36 on pages 436 and 37. Um, Nathaniel's thinking, the magician's knowledge of his activities had caught him horribly off guard and he was no longer in control. That is, make pieces understanding of what Nathaniel's been up to has him off balance. Nathaniel made a reluctant decision. If make peace knew of his visit to Balaam, there's no point concealing it. And he says, I've conducted some investigations. The staff is in the hands of Kitty Jones. Okay. So 437, make peace says, um, when, when Nathaniel says, and I'm trying to find her, I'm going to get control of her and the staff, etc. Make peace says, I have another possible idea, Matt Ray. I have a contract who has one foot in London and murky underworld. He is acquainted with more beggar sleeves and cut purses than you could cram into a theater. I shall talk to him tonight, see if he can give us a word. In other words, I'm gonna let my low life contact find this Kitty Jones, all right? You go home and sleep. Don't tell anybody else about our arrangement. 37, chapter 37. Now Bartimaeus is, uh, what do you want? Perspective. So this is Bartimaeus narrating. 
And he says on 439, he's thinking about Nathaniel. And the page starts, top of the page. Um, well, it talks about it at, at the bottom of the previous page, having had to do things that he wouldn't necessarily do on his own, things that he didn't like to do. And he says, you know, top of 439, not that I have a conscience, of course, but even we hardened gin sometimes feel a little soiled by the things we're called upon to do, right? And notice the word have is italicized. Um, go back to the scene where Jacob Hirnick and Kitty um, get caught by Julius Tallow three years ago. And what Julius Tallow's demon, Nemiades, says in response to Kitty's pleading, you know, let us go. And kind of says, you know, would you rather I suffer the shriveling fire? She, well, yes, of course I would. And he kind of, you know, she kind of says, you know, that's understandable, but alas, you know, that cannot be. And, you know, let's get this over with. It seems, it appears, to me at least, the gin do have some kind of conscience. I don't know how you want to define that. Um, they have a moral code inside that left up to their own will, they would follow, all right? Look at what Bartimaeus says, says again. We hardened gin sometimes feel a little soiled by the things we're called upon to do. Called upon here means ordered. And, and when he says we feel a little soiled, means we feel dirtied by it, okay? There's no other way to describe that, but they know it's the wrong thing to do. So he keeps thinking, he's in a crow form, and says, Nathaniel, what was there to say? Despite our occasional distances, I'd once hoped that he might turn out slightly different from the normal run of magicians. He'd shown a lot of initiative in the past, for instance, in more than a crumb of altruism. Now what's altruism? Thinking of others, how, how does, Taryn define heroism, thinking more of others than of yourself. It doesn't mean thinking, oh, I'm horrible, I'm small, I'm low, and others are great and wonderful or good. It means putting what is best for others before what is best for oneself. It had been barely possible that he might follow his own path through life. That is, that he might follow his own moral compass and not just go down the old power, wealth, notoriety road that every one of his fellows chose. So notice the juxtaposition Bartimaeus has created, that he might have followed his own, I'm going to use an old Greek word, daemon, D-A-E-M-O-N, or daemon, or as it's commonly pronounced, demon, meaning genius, his own inner spark that directs him to be what he should or ought to be, you know, rather than doing what everybody else does. And what have we, what have we learned about magicians so far? The vast majority of them are great and follow the leader. Right? And those who aren't great at following the leader are great at knifing the backs of those ahead of them so that they can become the leader, right? But had he, that is, had he followed his own path? Nope, signs were not worse than ever, okay? Um, the demise of his colleague Tallow, 
perhaps stolen several by witnessing the demise of his colleague Tallow. My master had been cut, had been curt to the point of rudeness when he summoned me that morning. He was at his palest, the most taciturn. No friendly conversation with me, no tactful pleasantries. And what Bartimaeus means is no, no verbal banter, no back and forth. I received no further praise from my dispatch of the renegade. A freak the night before, and despite changing into a few beguiling female shapes, didn't get a single rise out of them. What I did get was a prompt new task. Okay. So he had to go find Kitty. Um, Let's see, 442, 443. So, Bartimaeus finds Jacob here now. He kind of thinks, if I can find Jacob, I'll find a connection with Kitty and such. Um, he mentions Tallow, he mentions what happened to Tallow, you know, Tallow in previous chapter uh, had been doing a summoning, he hadn't drawn his Circle correctly, he left a little weak spot. The Afrik came out, swallowed Tallow, right? Um, in Jacob 444, his face lights up at that. It's the best news he's ever heard. You know, he's dead. You're sure? Saw it with these eyes. Well, you know, you know what I mean. So many went wrong, the fool misread the words or something. And in the chapter, it was mentioned, you know, maybe he misread the words on the page, or maybe there was a spelling error on the page, okay? Here next grin broadened. He was reading from a book. A book, yes, that's generally where incantations are to be found. Can we please, he said, um, thankful for the information. What's he getting at? What do we find out Jacob's father has been doing in some of the books he's copied. He puts errors in. He intentionally inscribes errors into the book, know, or into the books, knowing that when a magician uses that incantation and uses a wrong word or a mispronunciation, mispronounces a word, that could have dire effects or results for the magician, right? Um, so let's see. Okay. Uh, um, Kitty finds Mr. Hopkins. She asks about Nick. He doesn't know where he is. This is pages 450 and following. Um, Mr. Hopkins says, you know, nothing was taken. That is from Gladstone's tomb. You were unable. He doesn't finish it. What's he getting at? Where's the staff? Okay. She says, top of 451. We loaded up the contents of the tomb, but we couldn't escape. Maybe Nick got something out. Hopkins, but but you yourself, you, you got nothing? She says, I dropped my bag. He's, oh, of course, of course. What's, he wants to know who's got the staff. He says, I don't know. Don't suppose you know what became of Gladstone's staff. I mean, she says that was left behind. Oh, no. There's no mention of it being located in the abbey or any sign of it. Well, then Nick took it, she says. What does it matter? It's not valuable, is it? According to you. Because he said, you know, if there is this staff there, I would just kind of like it, you know, not that it's worth anything, of course. Okay. Um, he asked Kitty what her plans are. She says, not sure, think of something. Um, Hopkins says that Mandrake believes Kitty has something to do with the resistance and that so is Jacob Hearnack. Okay. He tells her that he implies that Jacob's been taken to the Tower of London. Um, 
And she says, bottom of 454, if this boy hurts Jacob, if he hurts me in any way at all, believe me, Mr. Hopkins, I will kill him with my own hands, him and any demon who stands in my path. <coughs> okay. So she asks where he is, and she, he says, I do know the address. I can give it to you. So we're going to skip a bunch. We're going to pick up in chapter 40. Um, Nathaniel and Bartimaeus are kind of in a stakeout, I guess you could call it. Um, a, they've set a trap to capture uh, Kitty. Jacob is the trap, so to speak. Okay. Um, they get attacked. Jane Farrar shows up with the night police, werewolves. Skip a bunch. I definitely want to try and get this all done in one lecture. Um, let's see here. Jane Farrar is talking with Nathaniel on 482 and following, saying, you know, her master has saved him once, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I've got that highlighted. I don't really talk about it. Let's see. Kitty talks with Bartimaeus, 488 89. He talks, tells her about all the, you know, famous events he's been involved in, the fall of Carthage and Rome, et cetera, et cetera. Um, page 489. Okay, and this is Bartimaeus in his. Uh, Ptolemy guys. Let's see here. Um, Four eighty nine at the bottom. He says, "How long is it? How long is it since Gladstone set up shop? One hundred fifty years or so." Well, that's your answer. Resilience to magic takes a long time to build up in the general population. Because he's, he's, what he's getting at is, you know, Rome fell, Carthage fell prior to Rome. What was that? Third, second, third century BC? Something like that. Um, because the commoners rose up and overthrew the magicians. The commoners were able to rise up because as the years progressed, they developed resilience, right? So that eventually magic had no effect on them. So he goes on. It takes a long time to build up in the general population, page 490. Magicians had ruled in Rome for 500 years before the revolutions came. It's an awful lot of magic seeping through the city. Gradually, more and more children are born with talents of one sort or another. What else can you do? For instance, CS, Kitty, no. Anne and Fred could do that. I'm just, you know, good at surviving. He grins. That's no mean talent. Don't knock it. Stanley can see magic in stuff, she says. And that's how we knew you had that necklace. He says, oh, the amulet? Okay. And he asks, how did you find out? Okay. And so she goes on and talks about things. She mentions Talo's monkey. Um, she says, not unless you tell me more about you, what happened after the tumbler? Okay. And the demon says, 491, problem with this penny feather was that he was much too like the magicians, wasn't he? See, penny feather said he, he wanted to overthrow the magicians. He was too much like the magicians, greedy, close classmate, wanted to keep everything nice and secret, all for himself. That is, he wanted the power. <coughs> Small wonder you had only 11 men only 11 people in all of the resistance, right? All those explosions and theft, they were never going to get you anywhere. Well, 
Kitty already thought that earlier in this book. I mean, she's like, what's it all, what, what, what are we doing? It's not going to make any difference. It's not going to bring about any real change. Right? Of course they weren't. Education's the thing. Knowledge of the past. Now, notice this. Nathaniel had history lessons, right? With Mr. Purcell. But what, kind, what was Mr. Purcell teaching? History? Propaganda. Okay? He was teaching the kind of history that they wanted to be taught that supported the magicians and the people in power, okay? This is why real history is important. This is why, you know, this is why it's important to keep monuments and things from the past that might have been erected, you know, in, in support of slavery or in support of slaveholders, et cetera, et cetera. Because once you start erasing all of that, you start getting rid of all of that, you start to forget what happened. And when you forget what happened, it happens again. That's why, you know, after the Second World War, it was said, never forget. Never forget about what the Nazis did, which is why Jews today are still, you know, if somebody starts talking about wiping out Jews, they tend to take that kind of language very, very seriously, which is why you should, you know, when your enemy speaks, listen to what your enemy says and take it seriously. So education is the thing, knowledge of the past. That's why the magicians give you such ropey schooling. Ropey meaning balderdash. I bet you had endless triumphal stuff about why Britain's, Britain's so great. Funny thing is the people's growing resilience always comes as a surprise to the magicians too. Okay, why? Because the magicians are getting propaganda. They're not getting real, just like the history Kitty was getting in school that we heard about, Nathaniel was getting the same kind of utter BS. Each empire thinks it's different, thinks it won't happen to them. They forget the lessons of the past, even recent lessons. I mean, we could talk about all kinds of stuff just with the United States, you know, going back 20 years or going back 40 years or going back 60 years, okay? Gladstone only got to Prague so fast because half the Czech army was on strike at the time. It seriously weakened the empire, but my master and his friends have already forgotten this fact. He hadn't a clue why you escaped his mallard the other day. Okay, so Bartimaeus is saying, when you escape from his mallard, the thing you have no idea why that happened or how that could even happen. Incidentally, he really is taking ages to bring here at the cross. I'm beginning to think something might have happened to him. So he's kind of putting two and two together. So he asks, why did you come looking for this unit? You must have known it was a trap. He said you hadn't seen it for years. Kitty, I haven't. It's my fault he's in this mess. Notice what Kitty is saying. Her concern for Jacob is greater than her concern for herself. It's her fault he's in this mess. So she's going to possibly pay with her own life to get him out of this mess. Bartimaeus, yes. And notice that, yes, it's kind of drawn out like, okay, I just think it's odd, that's all. Odd what? That somebody would think of somebody else more than herself. Kitty, what can you know about it, demon? You're a monster. How dare you even imagine what I'm feeling? The boy tuts. Let me give you a friendly tip. Now, you wouldn't want to be called female mud spawn, would you? Well, in a similar way, when addressing a spirit such as me, the word demon is, in all honesty, a little demeaning. To us both, the correct term is Jimmy. Though you may add adjectives such as noble and, you know, just a question of manners. So notice, 
He says it's demeaning to both of us. What is that showing on Bartimaeus' part? Concern for Kitty. He doesn't want her to demean herself. He says it's just a question of matters. Keep things friendly between us. No one's friendly with the demon. Not normally, no. But it has happened, and he pauses. Yeah, take it from me. When? Oh, long ago, doesn't matter. What form is he in? You're making it up. Kitty waited, but the boy was studying its fingernails again. He's in Ptolemy's form. Why does he take this form? We were told in the first book, he was a boy he loved many years ago. Right. Why does Mandrake? Why did Mandrake save me from the wolves? She says, "He wants his death." Why? Why do you think power? He's trying to get it before the others. Kitty. Oh, so the staff is important. See, she doesn't know. It's Gladstone. You knew that. Otherwise, why break into his tomb? Oh, you didn't know. In other words, you were completely oblivious. You were set up. By who? Hopkins? She says, yes, and someone else. I never saw who. Right? So you don't know anything about the goal? She's like, nope. Page 494. Um... He tells her, you'd have a better chance of stopping it than me. Right? She says, thanks. I'm serious. A golem's controlled by a manuscript hidden in its mouth. If you got close and whipped the paper out, the golem would return to its master. Just disintegrate. Now, notice they're just killing time, right? They're, they're waiting for Mandrake to show up with Jacob Hirnik. But what has Bartimaeus just done? If you're familiar with the Harry Potter novels, it's the same kind of thing Dumbledore does in the first Harry Potter novel when he catches Harry on the third night of Harry looking into the mirror of Erisette. He kind of tells Harry what it is, what it does, and how it works. And then he says, if you should ever see it again, now you'll be prepared. Well, it's because he's going to see it again. He's just told her how she can, what, deactivate the golem, pull the manuscript out of its mouth. He says, I can't. Why? Go back to the previous page. It's resistant to magic. All right? So she now has the knowledge how to stop the golem. So Kitty asks, 494, if it's so easy, how come the magicians haven't stopped it? Look at his response. Because it would, it would require personal bravery. Remember, magicians have no magic themselves. All right? They never do anything themselves. They rely on us. So magicians don't, they don't put their necks out. They don't risk their lives for somebody else. Mandrake gives me an order, I obey. He sits at home, I go out and suffer. That's the way it works. Kitty, sounds tough. Notice, she begins by calling him demon. What do you care, demon? And he kind of corrects her and you know teaches her some manners. And now she says, sounds tough. Meaning, man, that sucks. That's the way it works. No choice. That's why I'm interested in you coming out to rescue Hirnak. He's trying to understand. Let's face it, stupid decision. You didn't have to make it. No one's forcing you to do anything. You got it wrong, but for admirable reasons. That is, you made the wrong decision, but you had admirable, noble reasons. Believe me, it makes a change to see that after hanging around with magicians so long. It's almost like he's saying, 
you know, there's some hope for humanity. Kitty, I didn't get it wrong. This is the right choice. This is the right decision. It's the right action. So she asks, how long has it been? And she means, you know, how long has it been since commoners last, you know, overthrew? He says, you know, 5,000 years or more. Uh, excuse me. He says, you know, after hanging around with magicians for long, she says, how long has it been? That is, how long have you been hanging around with magicians? 5,000 years. And he says, and when one empire falls, another one rises up. And when that one falls, another one rises up. He said, and Kitty says, and Britain will fall too. He said, oh yeah, cracks are already shut. Right? And then he says, 495. You know, I've quite enjoyed our conversation. I hope they don't order me to kill you. Why? Because he won't want to. He won't enjoy it, but he'll have to. Right? Chapter 43. Let's see. I don't think there's anything really here. Um, Nathaniel then captured. He's talking with Devereaux and Duval and such. And he says 503, you know, he's asking about uh, Kitty, the girl, she'll go free. Excuse me, who is this speaking? Uh, Nathaniel's talking to Devereaux and Duval. And Devereaux asks Nathaniel. Um, let's see. Devereaux asked Nathaniel, you plan to restore the staff to me? Of course, sir. I hoped I would see it one day sitting next to the amulet of Samarkand in the government vaults, et cetera, et cetera. And the girl, she'll go free. This is Devereaux asking Nathaniel, bottom of page 503. He goes, oh, no. Once I have the staff, she and Hearnet can be interrogated at pleasure. And Duval says, the boy's a consummate liar. You're not going to be taken in. Right? And Devereaux says, I've made my decision. Mandrake, you can go do what you're going to do, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Um, 44. Let's see. Nope, I didn't skip that. Page 511. Um, we have Mandrake, Bartimaeus, <coughs> Jacob Hurenek, and Kitty. And it, it's kind of a, you know, a meeting. Um, and Kitty says, page 511, I wish to talk with Jacob. He says, there he is. So she goes up and she whispers to him, you all right? And he says, I'm fine. And she tells Jacob, I'm going to accept Mr. Mandrake's offer. Do you have anything to say? The weakest of smiles. And Jacob says, no, no, Kathleen. You can trust him. She hesitates, nods, turns away. Okay. Why does she nod? She heard the clue. What did Jacob call her? Kathleen. Jacob only calls her Kitty. She knows it's not Jacob or it's Jacob under somebody else's control. And we're told on 512. Bartimaeus is thinking about Kitty. In contrast to my master, the girl seemed very self-possessed. It occurred to me that she knew 
he would utterly betray, he would betray it. Let's face it, he didn't need a Jenny's brain to guess that much, but was going to her doom calmly nonetheless. The guinea pig nodded regretfully to itself, that is, Bartimaeus in the guinea pig form. More than ever, I admired her resolve and the grace with which she exerted it. But that's free will for you. I did not have that luxury in this world, right? <coughs> so she's voluntarily giving herself up for Jacob Hearnick. And he still, he respects that. He doesn't understand it and such. Um, 516. She's talking with Mandrake. Right? He has the staff. And she says, he made a promise. A promise. He frowned vaguely. Why the frown? He knows he made a promise. And he knows he's going to break it. To let us go. I noticed her suddenly shifting her weight onto the front of her feet as she spoke, like, like a, a sprinter getting ready to break out of the blocks. I mean, she's getting her balls and teeth ready to spring. I wonder what she planned to do. Ah, yes. Nathaniel. There might have been a time a year or two back when Nathaniel would have honored any agreement he had made he'd have considered it beneath his dignity to break a vow, despite his enmity with the girl. It may be that even now, part of him still disliked doing so. Certainly, he hesitated for a moment, as if in actual doubt. Now, notice, Bartimaeus can't read Nathaniel's mind. This is him kind of projecting what he thinks Nathaniel is thinking. Then I saw him glance up at the red spheres, right? He's being watched which had emerged from the cellar and were once more hovering above. So everything he does is being observed. So how much free will does he have? His eyes went dark. His master's gazes were on him in that decided matters. Notice, he's in the same predicament as Bartimaeus is in. He has no free will here. If he doesn't turn her in, what's going to happen? She's still going to be caught, and he'll be caught. He will suffer just as much as she will for really no reason. Promises made to terrorists are scarcely obligatory. Ms. Jones, he says, our agreement is void. You will be interrogated, tried for treason forthwith, and I shall make it my business to escort you to the tower myself. Do not try anything. His voice rises. He's warning her. She slipped a hand into her jacket. Your friend's life head hangs by a thread. Sophocles, reveal yourselves, or yourself, and the folia on Jacob Hernet's shoulder becomes apparent. And she says, very well. Your weapon, whatever it is in your coat, bring it out slowly. And she says, it's not a weapon. Okay? It's not a weapon. It's a present. And she pulls out his scrying glass that was taken from him three years previously by Fred and Stanley and Kitty. His eyes widen. Have it back, she says. Okay. The disc flew spinning high into the air. Instinctively, we watched it go. Nathaniel, the foliot, and I, as we watched the girl act, her hands reached out, snared the foliot around its scrawny neck jerking it backward off your neck's shoulders. It was taken by surprise. Its grip was loosened, its talons, talons snicking in midair, but its slender tail looped up around your neck's face, fast as a whip, and began to squeeze. Your neck cries out. <coughs> okay. Nathaniel stepping backwards. He's reaching out to grab the thing. She's squeezing the folia. It's tightening its tail on Jacob's head. Bartimaeus watches all this. Kitty was lying on her resilience here, that is, on her ability to throw off any magic and stuff, on her power to counteract the foliot's magic. It all depended how strong that resilience was. It was quite possible that the foliot would soon reassert itself, crush her next skull, and move on to deal with her. But the girl was strong, and she was angry. 
The foliage's face swelled. It uttered a reproachful sound. Crisis point was reached, and it bursts into vapor. They fall to the ground. A scrying glass lands in Nathaniel's hand. He cries out, Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus says, yeah. Why didn't you act to halt this? I gave you strict instructions. Bartimaeus, you did, you did. I told you to kill her if she tried anything. And we hear the car, come on, okay? Well, Nathaniel wants, why aren't you doing something? You told me to kill her if she broke the terms of your agreement. Yes, by escaping, as she's doing now, get to it. No, dead agreement is null and void. You broke it yourself, not two minutes ago, in a particularly noxious manner. That is, I cannot fulfill your order to me to do something if she breaks the agreement, if you've already broken the agreement. So she can hardly be breaking it herself, can't you? Listen, if you put that staff down, you can tear your hair out more easily. I rescind all previous orders, issue new one, which you cannot misinterpret. Stop them from departing in that car. He says, okay. So he gets off and he starts to go towards the car. And page 519. Surprise. Up from behind the body of the car popped a smiling face. Well, grinning, really. Skulls, as we know, don't really smile. What is it? It's Honorius, the spirit that embodied, you know, the skeleton. And it wants the staff, okay? Talks about being, you know, what happened when it was cast into the Thames and stuff. Um, Let's see here. The golem comes. It, let's see here. The spirit, the demon reaches up for Jacob. Jacob says, why me? I've done nothing. 524, I know, dear child, but you're full of life. And after my time underwater, I frankly need the energy. It reached out a hand, and as it did so, it noticed for the first time the dark cloud stealing across the courtyard, sucking the light. And it said, well, well, what's this? Skeleton paid no heed. It swiveled its pelvis straight in the face of the cloud. Jacob gives a start. Okay, and it says something like, I defy you. Bartimaeus is talking to Kitty. He said, don't worry, my orders are to prevent you leaving in that car. Go anywhere near it, I'll have to stop you. Otherwise, do what you like. Remember, we're told the demons are very literal in terms of their commands. So she asks, what's this darkness? He says, it's the golem. Remember that golem? Well, it's turned, it's, it's turned up. That wretched staff is the root of all our trouble. The golem wants the staff. Oh, Rich reminds me. Oh, he's not. Tell me he's not. Well, the lip. And we hear Nathaniel's trying to activate the staff. He thinks he can kill the golem. 525. If he's trying some simple activation without reinforcement or muting spells, he's asking for trouble. He hasn't a clue how much energy it contains. Over ambition, always been his problem. Kitty, please, Bartimaeus, is that your name? How could we get out? Can you help us? You could break through a wall. He says, um, why should I? Well, because you don't mean us harm. You've just been following orders. I'm a wicked demon, right? Because that's what she said. He said so. Anyway, even if I wish to help you, we don't want to draw attention to ourselves right now. If I do something magical, the golem's going to come after us. Right. Oh, he's saying we should just stay here, keep our heads down. The golem's going to get what? 
Well, it's going to get Honorius, and it's also going to get Mandrake. 526 at the bottom. Mandrake had better hurry. Whoops, there goes Honorius again, you know. And the skeleton goes. All at once, page 527, a rush of sound, a pulse of blue light, the skeleton shattered, fragments of bone shoot out, and Honorius is gone. All right. And Bartimaeus says, that was strange. Honorius didn't mean to do that, you know. Totally foolhardy, suicidal act, go brave. Despite being mad, he must have known it would destroy him. Golems negate our magic. Maybe he was tired of this one. That is, <coughs> maybe he was tired of suffering in this world. Do you understand, Kitty? And then Jacob says, Kitty, come on, let's go. Yes. And then she looks at Mandrake. The golem is approaching Mandra. His eyes are closed. He's trying to recite the words of his spell. Jacob, come on. Bartimaeus, looks like Mandrake's for it. The golem is going to get Mandrake. Jacob's like, let's get out of here. We can leave. And Kitty's pausing. Kitty shrugged and began to inch after Mandrake, after Jacob. Just then, Mandrake looked up, page 528. At first, he seemed oblivious to the coming danger. Then his gaze fell upon the advancing Gola. His face broadened into a smile. He holds the staff out, speaks a single word, a nebulous light of pinks and purples drift around the body of the staff, rising toward its top. Kitty pauses. There's a tremble. Bartimaeus, he can't have no way. He can't have mastered it. Not the first time. The boy's smile widens. He pointed Gladstone's staff toward the golem, which paused uncertainly. Uncertainly because the golem doesn't know what this portends. And bear in mind, the golem doesn't think. The golem is being directed by another intelligence. Colored lights play about the carvings on the staff. The boy's face was alive with the radiance of terrible joy and a deep commanding voice. He utters a complex charm. Flux about the staff flares. Kitty closes her eyes. Flux wobbled. You know, shoots back down along the boy's arm. His head jerks back. He's lifted off his feet. He's blasted into the wall behind him. Bartimaeus. And, you know, the staff falls on the ground. He hadn't mastered it. Thought as much. Jacob's like, Kitty, come on. And the golem makes its way towards. Mandrake, who's now passed out on the ground. She goes to follow Jacob and then asks Bartimaeus, 529, what's going to happen? Now, um, you'll run off, the golem will kill Mandrake, grab the staff, take it to whichever magician's watching through that eye. And you, you won't help him? I'm powerless against the golem. Notice he doesn't say, no, <laughs> he says, I'm powerless. And what he's implying is, even if I wanted to, I can't do anything, right? I've tried once already. Besides, when you were escaping just now, my master overruled all his previous charges, which included my duty to protect him. If Mandrake dies, I go free. It's not in my interest to help him. Definition, definition of a hero. One who cares more for others than for himself. Artemis, according to what he just said, is no hero. It's now getting closer. Kitty looked at Mandrake, lying unconscious. She bites her lip, turns away. And Bartimaeus says, I don't have free will most of the time, you see. So when I do, I'm hardly likely to act in a way that injures myself if I can help it. That's what makes me superior to muddled humans like you. It's called 
common sense. Bartimaeus defines common sense as save yourself. Off you go. Your resilience might well not work against the golem. Refreshing to see you doing exactly what I would do in getting out while the going's good. Now, do you think he means that seriously? Or entertain this possibility. Bartimaeus is playing mind games with Kitty. See, he can't stop the golem. He's already told her, previous chapter, how she can stop the goal. Pull the manuscript out of its mouth. Okay. What if he just told her she will be doing if she flees? She will be acting just as he would be acting. In other words, he's equating her actions with those of a, oh, let's use her term, wicked demon. To kind of reverse psychology. So is he really doing this to try to, you know, uh, what's the word I want? Um, embolden in her this, this nobility that she has demonstrated before, this courage, this heroicness or heroism. She blows her cheeks out, takes a few steps more. That is a few steps more towards Jacob Hirnick and away from Mandrake. And she looked back over her shoulder towards Mandrake. Mandrake wouldn't have helped me. Exactly. You're a smart girl. Off you go. Leave him to die. She looks at the golem. It's too big. I could never tackle it. Telling us what? She's thinking of trying to tackle it. She's thinking of trying to stop it. Especially once it's past that limousine, that is, once it gets past that limousine, it's kind of, you know, free, free territory. If you're going to do something now, Kitty, you better do it. See, Bartimaeus is working her like a violinist playing a violin. He's trying to get her to perform an action. And that action is to save John Manor. Oh, hell. And she runs not toward the stricken Jacob, but towards the lumbering giant. She ignores the pain and numbness in her shoulder, <coughs> ignoring her friend's desperate, despairing shouts. Most of all, she ignores the voices in her head, ridiculing her, screaming out the danger, the futility of her action. That common sense, it says, run away from danger. She puts her head down, increases her speed. And she's no demon, no magician. She was better than they. See, he wanted her to think, oh, if you run away, you're just like us. Greed and self-interest were not her only self-concerns. She scampered around the back of the golem, close enough to see the rough smears on the surface of the stone, to smell the wet earth, etc. She leaps onto the top of the limousine, this is why it's important that once it gets past the limousine, she won't be able to stop it because she can get on top of the limousine to grab around, to get up high enough to get onto the golem. The sightless eyes stared forward like those of a dead fish. Above them, the third eye sparkled with malign intelligence. Its gaze was fixed firmly on Mandrake's body. It did not perceive Kitty at its side, jumping with all her strength to land on its back. Okay. She'd expect the golem to reach up behind her, pick her up and throw her off. It didn't even feel her. Why? All of its intelligence is in that eye. And it's not the golem's intelligence. It's the magician directing it. Okay? She reaches forward with her arm, trying to get into the mouth. She couldn't reach it. The golem stopped, 531. With surprising suddenness, its back began to bend. Kitty was flung forward, almost head first over it. She had a brief glimpse of the lumpen hand below, reaching out and down toward the unconscious boy. So it's now gotten to Mandrake, and it's reaching down to get him. She begins to fall, her grip falls. Rough, cold stone, jagged snags that might almost have been teeth. Right? Her hand is inside the mouth. 
something else, soft coarseness, she grasps it in the same moment, loses all purchase, that is hold. So she's holding on with one arm around the creature's back and with the other, because she's kind of now hanging in front, with the other, she's got into the mouth. She's got the thing in the mouth. She stumbles forward over its shoulder, landing heavily on the prone figure of the boy. So, Mandrick is unconscious on the ground. She's on her back on top of Mandrake, looking up at the golem. So now physically, what does she become? She's a shield. She's between the golem and Mandrake. She's using, maybe not here intentionally because she fell off it, but she's placed her body between death and Mandrake. And she screams because the face of the goal is right above her. The gaping mouth, the sightless eyes, top of 532. The third eye fixed upon her alive with fury. As she watched, the fury dimmed. Why? Because she's got the parchment in her mouth, in her hand. And the eye goes dim, the intelligence goes out, the eye on the forehead was nothing but a clay oval. She raises her head, looks at her left hand. There's the manuscript. She props herself up. Right? Mad, quite mad. The Egyptian boy was standing beside her, hands on hips, shaking its head gently. You're as mad as that of frequent. Still, at least you got a soft landing. Jacob comes down, approaches her. He looks at Mandrake, is he dead? He's still breathing, more is the pity, Bartimaeus says. Why does he say more is the pity? He's being sarcastic. I mean, you could maybe argue, yes, he is being true because if Mandrake had died, then Bartimaeus would be free, right? But I don't think he is being serious. I, I think he, he's being facetious. He didn't want Mandrake dead. By your foolhardy actions, you condemn me to further toil. I would take issue with you, but there are some strange, there were some search fears here earlier. I think the golem cloud caused him to retreat. They'll be back in soon. Um, you should leave. Kitty says, yes. Spartimaeus, what about the staff? You could take it. No one's going to stop you. No, it's no good to me. All right? Chapter 46. Nathaniel's eyes open up. Okay. Kitty's not there, notice. He asks about the staff. And there's the staff propped up against his legs. All right. Page 536. He says, uh, Kitty Jones, she, she must have fled. Wrong again. I'll tell you, shall I? Bartimaeus says. You knocked yourself out like the idiot you are. The golem was approaching. It was coming. It was going to take the staff, crush you. It was foiled. You think by your prompt action? If so, I'm grateful. Me, save you, please. No. They wait, wait, don't mock. The boy distracted it while the girl climbed on the golem's back, tore the manuscript from its mouth, threw it to the ground. Even as she did so, the golem seized her and the boy, incinerated them in seconds. Then its life force ebbed and it finally froze. So, Kitty and Jacob saved you. But in doing so, they die. It makes no sense. I know, I know. Why should she save you? The mind boggles that, but save you she did. And if you don't think it's true, well, seeing believing. And he shows them the manuscript. So, girl, but I was taking her to the tower, 537. I'd hunted her up. No, she'd kill me. Not safe by that. I don't believe you. You're lying. She's alive. She's fled the place. Whatever. That's why she left the staff with you when you were helpless. Okay. 
So he thinks maybe our enemy's name will be written on the parchment. And it burns up. Okay. So now the golem should return to its master. Page 539. So they go towards the center of town. And you know, Nathaniel has the staff. And we're told bottom of the page, Devereaux would fall at his feet for that. And better, he had the golem. None of them had believed his story. Now they would be grumbling with apology. Duval, Maurice, all of them. Right? Fate of Kitty John was perplexing, but even here things have worked out well. Um, let's see. Where do I want to pick it up? Patient uh, 542. Um, Jane Farrar shows up. Five forty-six. The golem shows up. Duval says it may still be dangerous. We should vacate. Jessica Whitwell says it's returning to its master. We must stand still and wait. And the golem goes to Henry Duval. He's the one who said it all in the motion. Um, Five forty-nine. Mandrake, Nathaniel, gets a promotion. He is now head of internal affairs. Julius Tallow is dead. Okay. And he and Bartimaeus are talking. Bartimaeus is getting ready to go off. And Duvall is confessed on 551. Let's see. Uh, Where do I want to pick up? 554, they talk about Kitty. They talk about her admirable qualities and such. You know, it's, it's a shame that she died. Um, 555, Kafka's children have been released from prison. They're back in Prague. So Bartimaeus says, are you going to let me go now? Are you going to release me? Um, and John says, I will honor our agreement. He's going to go to the theater with Quentin Makepeace. Let's see. Five sixty. And he's talking with. Jacob and Mrs. Hirnick. Um, Five sixty-one. Kitty says, but from what Bartimaeus said, the magicians don't know much either about demons. They just use them. That's the point. We, the resistance, weren't getting anywhere. We were just as bad as the magicians, using magic without understanding it. I already knew that, really, and Bartimaeus kind of confirmed it. You should have heard of Jacob. Jacob, like I said, you're an idiot. Listen, that's my call, right? He says, write to me. Don't get yourself killed. And Kitty goes off to the continent, seemingly, okay? And we finish this book, and the next one, Ptolemy's Gate. Ptolemy is the Ptolemy that we've seen Bartimaeus in disguise as, the young Egyptian boy. And we finally get the full story as to why he takes on that guise and what the importance was and what the relationship was between them. And we're going to continue to see Nathaniel develop and grow, become powerful, and we're going to continue to see Kitty, right? Um, I will have a quiz for 
Bartimaeus up. Uh, today's Thursday. Maybe this evening, probably by tomorrow night, it will be due Sunday evening by 11.59. For Tuesday, read about the first, what do we have? We've got three days. For the Golem, for Ptolemy's Gate, read about the first third of Ptolemy's Gate for Tuesday. 